Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Michonne LeBron, if the lyrics of his life were to tell a story, it may be how it all comes true, how to be of service, and to assist and be you. And when you listen to his music and watch his creativity, you will hear the journey of transformation and flow of his life's intricacies and secrets. How does someone go from service, 13 years of being a state of Florida corrections officer and metropolitan police officer in DC, and still a court security officer contracted by US Marshals into what would seem to be a seismic transmission into being an acclaimed artist, actor, musician, writer, playwright, director, mentor, and activist? Because the underlying theme of his life and all that he does is service, assist, protect, and justice. And these are intertwined into all that he does. Can you hear the sirens blaring? Oh, they must be hearing the sounds of all of his acclaim for his incredible work, Spook and Power, just to name two. There's so much more to say, but I'm turning it over to JD. Hi, Michonne. Hey, how are you? <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Really, for sure. really appreciate it. So happy to have you. So there are so many questions. I can't promise that this is all going to go down in one show. Are you good with that? <laughs> I'm, that's fine. We, it, it gives me a chance to be invited back. <laughs> well, invited back real quick. <laughs> okay, let's let's start with, uh, first of all, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Miami, Florida. Uh, I was born and raised uh, in um, an area in Miami called um, uh, South Miami Heights and uh, lived there until I was about 10 or 11 years old. And then I moved to the uh, uh, northern part of Miami, in the city of Opalaka, or it used to be the section I lived in was called Carroll City, uh, <laughs> where the, it was the quote unquote colored side of town. Got it. So, <laughs> you know, and basically that's where I really got into the arts and music and poetry, uh, taking acting seriously. Oh, okay, so wait, so what age did, okay, the move happened, you said at um, what age, at 10? Uh, the move happened at the age of 10, but I was uh, actually acting in drama clubs okay. at the age of nine and had did my first like little commercial on like pacemakers at the age of nine. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So what were the greatest influences in your life before adulthood? Oh, man. Greatest influences? Man. My one of my first greatest influences as far as the artist was uh, Michael Jackson. Okay. <laughs> his his video thriller scared me. And I was just amazed of how those actors were able to like turn themselves into like creatures. So, <laughs> and so uh, I uh, <clears throat> that I was really amazed by that. And uh, just seeing different actors on, on television, Gary Coleman, um, Bugs Bunny, uh, you know, playing the different characters really got me into wanting to uh, be in this world of make believe, mm. um, watching the Star, Star Wars films and, and wanting to become this Jedi, you know, mm. that had all these powers these abilities to do all these magical things. So, you know, I think underneath all of that, you know, is I guess all of the different things that the young lady just read that 
you know, like the activism and, and uh, helping people, wanting to do something with, uh, with the art, with the act, um, which I didn't really understand as a, as a kid. I just, you know, I, I enjoyed the applause and people standing up and laughing, uh, but I, I wanted them to, to get more than just the laughing and the, and the applause. I wanted, I guess I wanted to change the people Mm -hmm. We didn't know what that meant. So, okay, so then you shifted, right? So where, where was the encouragement to go into Florida correction system? How did you go from this thrill? <laughs> <laughs> where'd, that, where'd that happen? Right, so, so that happened. Oh, that's, that's a funny story. So when I decided to make art a real thing, one of the things uh, that I noticed is that when you're trying to really pursue the whole art thing, there's a lot of starving. Mm. There's a lot of uh, lack of the opportunity to really pay rent or, you know, or feed yourself. And I tried the whole, you know, busing tables and um, server and I, I just couldn't do it. First of all, to balance all of those plates and stuff like that and carrying them out <laughs> in a hurry. I just, it, it couldn't, it just didn't work for me. And the first time I had a patron do the whole, hey, hey you, I knew I, I, knew I couldn't do it. I, just, <laughs> I could not do that. I couldn't do it. It was just, it was, just, it was too close to being like a, a slave. And I was yeah. just like, no, I can't, I can't do this. Um, so, it, but I always wanted to, to help people too. So my father was, uh, he was a community organizer, a pastor, and he brought me with him as a kid. And he would help people in the housing projects, and different things like that. And I, I would have liked to have been a police officer down in, uh, in, in Florida, but they were so racist. They had put a very bad, bad thing. And, 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 and let me say this, I don't mean to sound like the, the, the back in my day, but you know, growing up in the 80s and the 90s, we didn't have cameras. So the police officers can literally come out of their cars if you're, uh, Luther Campbell said this one time, he was DJing uh, in Miami and did, this happened. Uh, officers would get out of their cars if we're having like a block party you know, and, you know, come out, what you niggas are doing? Y'all turn that goddamn music down. Y'all that goddamn niggas, you niggas. I mean, you know, they just come out and say that, wow. you know, and, you know, like, like nothing. I mean, this is in the 80s. This is in the early 90s. This is some of them, if you get smart with them, they'll beat you down, you know, like for real beat down. Like some of the stuff I'm saying now, I'm like, yeah, come on, you, you, you cap it. Like, real police brutality. Um, so seeing that, I was just like, you know what? Uh, let me just try corrections first. Okay. You know, our brothers are in there and they're in there. Maybe I could do something good. That was me being young and naive. And it was a horrific experience. It was, uh, I was yeah. there for three years. It was a horrific Experience well, you know, wait, you know what I was going to say to you that it's appropriate that you're saying it because I was going to say, you know, I did a couple of women's groups in corrections mm -hmm. and it choked me out. So that's in line with what you're yeah. saying, which is it was horrific. It was it was horrific. Maybe if I would remain in the position of because when I first started there, I started off as a teacher's aide in the GED program, in the jail. Oh. Mm -hmm. So my, at that time, I think my father had become a chaplain. So I was like, well, let me do this. So I did that. And then I became a teacher in the GED program. You know, I was like, okay, got the promotion, helping them read and have a, that was fulfilling. But, you know, you're still confined. And I was like, well, let's take it to the next level. So I became an officer for the state. And I mean, the prison is a little community. It is their world. And they're there for five, 10, 15, 20 years, natural life. And it just, it, it was just horrible. It was just, it was horrible. I wasn't helping anybody. 
uh, I mean, of what I mean, care, custody, and control. You might as well just get the care out of it. Mm. You know, it's custody and control, and it's and it's not about re- reform. It's about punishment, torture, and punishment. That's that's what it is. It, it's not helping anybody. It was just demeaning for yeah. them, and it was demeaning for me. And so then I got out of it. And I said, okay, I was busy trying to make money so I could do my acting thing. I really didn't have enough time to act because I was always working eight or 16 hour days every other day, you know? So what I decided to do was just, I always was a bit of a writer. I started off as a, as a rapper and that trans, uh, trans uh, formed to just being writing poetry. So then I started, uh, doing the whole spoken word poetry thing around the late 90s in Fort Lauderdale. And I just fell in love with that movement. And so while I was a corrections officer, I was doing that. I joined on to a team in Fort Lauderdale called Love Jones of Fort Lauderdale. We had the opportunity to battle the New Yorican poets. Oh yeah. The first time they beat us, the second time we beat them, it was just, it was, I was floating on air. That was probably one of my best experiences as an artist you know, uh, it's the top 10. It's in my top 10. You know, it's just wonderful experience. So then, you know, wait, uh, so then you went from, from that, that amazing experience, yes. that horrific experience, and then you ventured to become a Metro Police person. What? Yes. So, so, <laughs> so after I did the poetry thing in Corrections, I said, well, look, you know, in the early 90s, I started off going to school, taking classes here and there. I was like, I'm so close, let me finish so I can dive deeper into my acting. I never wanted to be these people that just jumped on TV and didn't have any real classical training. So I went to a university called uh, Florida International University, had some amazing teachers there, had amazing teachers at uh, my school, Miami Dade Community College, with this teacher named Barbara Laurie. Just, oh, that's a whole nother subject. But uh, at FIU, I was able to study the Shakespeare classics. I had a chance to travel to London and meet Royal Shakespeare Company uh, artists and actors, train with their voice teachers. I mean, I got deep into this thing because I did not want to fake the funk, as they say, Mm -hmm. as an actor. I wanted to be for real. And uh, after that, I I joined a, a repertory company called Playground Theater. And I, I was in some films and you know, I was making money. But again, the ebb and flow, you got the ups and you got the downs. Right. You got the ups and then you got the downs. And plus, and I was in Miami the whole time. I just got tired of the violence there. The, the violence had never left from the 80s. It was just real rare. So I decided to move to DC. When I moved to DC, yes, I'm an artist, but it's a new market. It's close to New York and Philadelphia. So people got to get to know me. While they're getting to know me, you still got to eat. So I decided to take my experience to the Department of Justice, and I became a, a special deputy U.S. Marshal working with the Department of Justice. Wow. Um, contracted again with the U.S. Marshals. And while I was there, I wrote material, and I stepped on the scene with a show called uh, Right to Remain, Tupac Shakur. I did that where I played Tupac, the one man show. That brought every, that brought everybody saying, who is this, who's this guy? Who is that guy? I took it all the way to London, off West End performance. But again, I have to pay rent. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I and I was mentoring at that time at a, a high school called McKinley Tech. And I was amazing, these kids. So I was like, I can even give them even more if I become a police officer. So I became a police officer. So while I was mentoring, I was a police officer. And while I was mentoring and being a police officer, I was still writing poetry and writing new shows like Power Carmine. So, so, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Okay, so, give me a second here. Um, so just look back on that for a minute. Because you said a couple of things that I think are really important to emphasize. One is that you had someone who was a mentor and then you became a mentor. So obviously 
you know, it meant so much to you to have somebody see you, which is a theme I always talk about, and the absence of which is uh, erasure or falling into the system. So I think that's, you know, so important. I want to just emphasize that. But then also you just, you kept that hustle. So it's interesting that you had this passion that was consistent, but you also weren't trying to go without a place to live. That was pretty consistent. Yes. Well, yes. And some people look at me kind of whatever with that. They're like, oh, you're not putting your, your, your all into it. You need to just, the hell with it, just go. And I understand that. I get it. I so get it. But for me, as I'm getting older at that time, you know, you, you know you're in your 20s, you're in your 30s, um, for me, it's not appealing to be in a one room studio with one chair and, 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 and a black and white TV. It's, it's it, for me, that's just for me. I think that as a man, you, yes, go after your dream, your goal, but you got to have something. And, 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 that's, and that's just me, it, you know, that's just me. Yeah, but I think that's something. That, go ahead. Hmm? No, I said, I think that was something that was probably instilled in me a long time ago. Uh, a professor asked, he said, what do you want to be? Do you want to be an artist or do you want to be a superstar? And I thought that was funny. It was like, well, I want to, of course, I want to be an artist. So, okay, I can help you be an artist. And being an artist, you can get to that level of stardom or whatnot. But if you just want to be a star, I can't help you with that. And I never wanted to just be a star. Because to me, a star doesn't have substance. A star is just told what to do, smile, take a picture, and get on the screen and make the funny face or the uh, face. <laughs> But I want to dive deeper into the artistry again, because I felt like by doing that, it will be able to help the people. Okay. You know, yeah, no, that makes sense. I, I can tell, I mean, you reflected on it just as I would wanted you to, which is kind of like what came up for you, what decisions you had to make and you, you were intentional. So I feel that I totally get that. Um, let me, I'm gonna shift gears for a minute. I want to find out about what does it mean to be contracted? It's a whole lot that I'm confused about. What does that mean? Mm. U.S. Marshal, special mm -hmm. duty. Yeah, that's a lot of words. Special what does that mean real quick? Right. I just want to get so, a sense so, that. so in, in a nutshell, basically, you are a federal officer, oh. but you're just con you're, but you're contracted with a company. So D.C. is made up of the worst. Remember back in the day, grandma and grandpa said, yeah, I mopped floors at the state capitol for 20 years and I got my pension. Yeah. Well, over time, those folks said, well, now wait, John mopped floors here for 20 years and that Negro is going to be living off a pension for the rest of his life? Oh, no, no, that's too costly. So what they ended up started, uh, began doing is contracting people. So you can mop floors. Oh, wow. Guess what? You are in charge of your retirement. Wow. Okay? I'll give you health benefits, but it's going to be very costly. So you do whatever you want with your money, but uh, it's going to cost you. So those of us that are not disciplined enough, a lot of times we walk away with little to nothing. That is heartbreaking. Those of us that are smart, <laughs> and I, I, I might add most of DC is contract all of these it people oh, or this no. clerk person or that clerk person all of these companies have come in said hey the u.s capital i got a company that does it work and all these employees here this work out a deal work out a contract a five-year contract and i can give you these people and they'll work for you. and it can you can it has some incentives if they are caught on their phone Oh, they, they, they just lose money for that day. I send them home for two days or three days or whatever. So you have a lot of that here in D.C. Majority of the employees that work in D.C. are contract. Wow. You just, you just. They give you the money. Yeah. Yeah. They give you the big money up front. Some of us, some of us are making some serious money. But okay. if you're not disciplined, 
you're not disciplined, you won't have nothing at the end of your 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. You know? Wow. So. Okay. Thanks for explaining that because I was lost on that. But I want to shift gears again because I want to get to the meat of who you are and what you're about. Now, I want to be honest with you. I'm not trying to put your livelihood in jeopardy. But I really want to know how long has this idea of spook been in your mind and then in reality? What what happened? How did that happen? Well, it, it, it happened from uh, a lifelong experience of looking at law enforcement and being in corrections and just being in that world, but also being Black in America, being a Black male in America. But I don't like to do that whole thing. Being a black man, being a black woman, we black, and everybody behind enemy lines. And I don't care if you are Christian, Jew, Muslim, Democrat, or Republican. If you are black, you're having a difficult time. Now that's just not me saying it. All of the great scholars and social scientists will agree to that. <laughs> so <laughs> growing up and seeing those things and experiencing. Uh, these different things. It was always in the back of mind. I had a sergeant of mine when I was in corrections that told me a long time ago, man, you need to write a play about being back here as a corrections officer. Man, that thing will be lit. Like, that was way back in 98. And I was like, you think so? They were like, man, I'm telling you, you need to do that. Well, fast forward when I became a police officer. I mean, I experienced and saw things that I was just like, wow, you know, the, the world as we see it, um, it's not just black and white. This world is gray, mm. you know, and it's sometimes it's hard to see where the line ends and where it begins. And, um, and, I, and I began to just write down my experience. And then I had a, a personal bad experience with a, with a sergeant and another sergeant and uh, the, the lieutenant and the commander and all the way up to the assistant chief. And I was just like, oh my goodness. And I just, uh, I began to reflect on that, my experience and, and other people's experiences that had spent 10, 20, 25 years on police departments. Those that were black in particular. And I said, my God, you know, it's already difficult being an officer, whether you're black or white. But then of course, it's like anything, you add, I, the, the element of being black. So now you're dealing with the racism on the inside of the department, but then the crime element on the outside, whether it's coming from a black person or a white person. The amount of pressure and stress that puts on you is just, it is unimaginable. And, and you're, wait, uh, and, and Michonne, let me just add one more thing. And you're not just talking about that piece, you have to add in the corruption. So the racism, oh, yes. right? Isn't that another layer? The racism, absolutely. So it, it, which is the reason why the monster, <laughs> the Spook Spokane, uh, how it was born. It was born out of all of that, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, what would happen to the individual uh, who just snapped like that. Listen, one of my, one of my mentors on the department told me himself, he had to talk an officer out of murdering his lieutenant. Not later on, not when he got home and then he creeps back and find out what a lieutenant, no, right there. Wow. At the department, at the precinct, they, they were gonna check off. We all usually have to stand in line and check off, give your paper and what you did and then leave. He was going to kill him right there. They were in line. He was talking to the man, man, what's wrong with you? Don't do that. He's like, man, think about your kids, man. Think about your kids. He said, the guy stopped, paused, looked at him and said, I can do the time. He pleaded with this man. He had to pull him out of the line and all. He said he was going to give him the paper and then kill him right there in front of everybody. And, and, and this, that's one story. I know. This, yeah. There's many stories where they pull gun, officers have pulled their guns out on each other in roll call. 
Okay. Okay. Clearly, <laughs> we have a lot. We have a lot more to talk about. And I'm I'm speechless. You know, we know that on the outside, but to hear somebody from the inside say it, you know, it, it's a whole other level. So I want to read something that um, how the film was identified. And then I want to just conclude with the fact that we have all the background we need, and then we're going to come back and kind of pick up on the details of the film. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So let's see. Um, someone said, well, I'm not I'm paraphrasing, but sort of a manifestation of institutionalized racism in America and the emotional toll Black cops policing Black people. Right, so it's the, yes. it's the, I just wanna say that again, cause that's really powerful. It's a manifestation of the institutionalized racism in America and the emotional toll it takes on black cops policing black people. And that just sounds so on point. That it, they added that it's haunt, hauntingly complex at times, skillfully uncomfortable. Man, that is it right there. Would you add anything mm -hmm. to that before we conclude? I, I wouldn't add anything. Uh, I don't know who, who wrote that, but uh, that was on point. Right? That was, yeah. That's, no, that's it. But I, I always uh, viewed this uh, film as a horror film. Oh, that's, that's oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I view it as a horror film. Okay, we're going to stop there. Thank you so much for the first part of this interview. Um, yes, looking forward to having you back. Okay? Oh, absolutely. Yes, Excellent.